Well, what we're doing is just priming the engine. They've got the fuel valve open. They're going to spin this engine around a few times, which will draw fuel into the cylinders. It will also draw air and oil. A couple of unique features, in addition to the fact that the engine rotates, which is really the big one, the fuel and lubrication system is unusual on a rotary engine as well. That big black tank on top of the cart, and that is just a test stand. It allows us to move this engine around. We don't cut loose after hours and fire that baby up and ride it around like a wind wagon. That large black tank is the fuel tank. Just behind the top cylinder is a small green tank. That's where the castor oil goes. Castor oil, you may ask yourself, why are we using that? We use that on people, I think. Well, we used to use it on people, too. We lubricated them with castor oil. We also lubricate this engine. The oil and the fuel are both introduced through the back of the hollow crankshaft. And if we use petroleum oil, it would mix with the gasoline. The gas wouldn't burn, the plugs would foul, the engine wouldn't run. So we use a vegetable-based oil. Castor oil comes from the castor bean. It is used as a laxative for people, folks. But it also lubricates engines tremendously well. In fact, it's still used in many automobile racing applications. So the fuel and the oil are introduced through the back of the hollow crankshaft into the crankcase. And in the case of the Gnome Monosupop engine, the Monosupop is French for single valve. The only valve on this engine is right at the end of the cylinder head. That's the exhaust valve. It is a four-stroke engine. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Like the engine in your automobile, the engine in most of these other airplanes. But the intake, it's not conducted through a valve. It's through a port, a lot like a two-stroke engine, like a, lawn mo a, a weed whacker or a chainsaw engine. The piston descends in the cylinder. It reveals that port. Fuel, air, and oil are drawn in through that port. Then we get compression, combustion, and exhaust. Now once this is running, I'm going to just clam up because you won't be able to hear me anyway. But what we're going to hear, hopefully, once we're running, there's no throttle on this engine. There's no gas pedal to control the speed of the engine. The speed is controlled by a selector switch which actually manipulates the, the, the electrical system. And we can run this at full speed, we can run it at half speed, where the electrical system is being grounded out half of the time. We can run it at quarter speed and we can run it at eighth speed. So once the pilot has this airplane running and flying, the engine's operating at a constant speed and these rotary engines typically run somewhere around 11 or 1200 RPM. And in order to slow the airplane down to bring it in for landing, the pilot has to manipulate this electrical control and he can cut it down to half speed, quarter speed, or eight speed, but it's all in the, the electrical. It's not the timing necessarily, but just the firing of the electricity and when the system is grounded out. So hopefully we'll get through all four selections on this switch Come on. We're going to get the engine started first, because I hear the Germans are headed this way. There's a little pop. That white smoke, nothing to worry about, ladies and gentlemen. A note about the castor oil that's being pumped through this engine to keep things lubricated. It is exhausted right out through the ends of the cylinder heads, through that exhaust valve with the ex exhausted smoke, the spent fuel. It's being blown all over the airplane, blown all over the pilot. If you take a look at our Sopwith pup after we've flown it, that pup is powered by an 80 horse Lerone rotary engine. The plane is completely covered in this sticky film. Well, the pilot is subjected to that as well. And it's in large part because of this fact that pilots from World War I wore what they wore. There are a couple of pieces of uniform that almost everyone recognizes belong to the World War I.
Yeah, maybe we'll give it another try. As I was saying, two pieces of uniform that every World War I pilot is recognized for, the scarf and the goggles. They're going to give it another try. The scarf